you know, my first book focused on statesmen. It focused on institutions like the UN. And for many people, I think that project uh, rendered decolonization a kind of elite project. Um, and it was focused on that, the, the realm of high politics. So in this project, I want to think through popular practices, uh, think through grassroots mobilization. And Garveyism, is, Garveyism is, is in some ways the perfect site from which to think the popular politics of Black internationalism and Pan-Africanism because it was the largest Black political movement of the 20th century. Um, so I rarely do this, but I do have a few, given that we're talking about visual politics, I did put together a very brief slideshow, which um, I'll start with um, and I'll turn it off um, in a, a few minutes later. Um, so let's hope I can make that happen. Okay. Okay, hopefully you can see that. All right, uh, the famed photographer, James Van Der Zee, whose Harlem studio was a central fixture of the 1920s New Negro cultural renaissance, was asked in 1926 to photograph the annual international convention of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA. This would not be Van Der Zee's first encounter with the UNIA. He had taken portraits of the UNIA leaders and had also photographed the 1924 convention. Um, this is a picture from 1924 of Marcus Garvey on a parade in his famous automobile and with his famous plumed hat. Um, all right, let's see. Um, here too is another image of the UNIA African Legion. Uh, this was an auxiliary group of, of, of four men within the organization, and this too was taken at the convention. And here is the women's UNIA Women's Brigade, also taken in 1924 by James Van Der Zee. So unlike these images, uh, the 1926 photograph shown here stands out for a number of reasons. First, though Van Der Zee and the subjects of the photograph might have not known it at the time, this would be the last UNIA convention in New York. He captured the UNIA at a moment of deep crisis after Garvey's arrest for mail fraud intens intensified factional disputes among the organization's leaders. Second, the image seeks to represent the convention in its totality. While the uh, while Van Der Zee's portraits focus in on individuals and the pictures I just showed of the 1924 a parade momentarily capture a small slice, slice of those present, this image of the 1926 convention seeks to fully capture the, U, the, the convention, fixing the UNIA in place. Young and old, women and men in uniforms, academic regalia, or their Sunday best, the members of the UNIA exceed the camera frame. Sorry, this is blurry, but um, seated on the center dais, here are the UNIA leaders. And an empty seat, um, sort of third from the center, um, adorned with regalia marks the absence of Garvey. This image fans out from the center with the gendered auxiliary, groups, uh, the men's African Legion in their black uniforms, um, and the women of the Black Cross in their radiant white, hierarchically ordered around the center. The rank and file members are further out from the dais. I'm sorry. Are further out from, um, are further out from the dais. Uh, sartorial markers and placement may clear the differentiation among members. Yet their collective gaze trained ahead and up at Van Der Zee's camera indicate a unity of purpose, a shared vision of their movement. At a moment when the organization was fraying at the center, recourse to the photographic image held the UNIA together. This artifact of collective forward motion captured in image the political program of racial unity that appeared at least momentarily unrealizable. Investment in photographic images was not new, a new feature of the UNIA's self-understanding by 1926. Visual representation had long been a key medium through which the organization conceived of its political program after its reconstitution following World War I. 
The UNIA was first founded by Marcus Garvey and Amy Ashwood, his first wife in Jamaica in, in 1914. At that moment, the organization committed itself to imperial loyalism among Britain's West Indian subjects. After De Britain declared war on Germany in August 1914, UNIA members in Kingston expressed their loyalty and devotion to the British Empire, bearing homage to the great protecting and civilizing influence of the English nation and people. These appeals to imperial belonging and citizenship sought to secure the political standing of colonial subjects in the British Empire. Yet by the end of the war, they had not only fallen on deaf ears, but were also violently repudiated in the racial terror that followed the end of military conflict. Garvey encountered this transformed political context in the United States rather than in the West Indies, where he pivoted away from imperial loyalism to a project of African uh, redemption. He initially traveled to the United States in 1916 with the very modest aim of raising funds to build a UNIA industrial school on the model of the Tuskegee Institute. A year later, however, in the immediate aftermath of the East St. Louis race riot, which killed 48 people, 39 of whom were African-American, he was thrust into the newly formed New Negro Movement. On the anniversary, the first anniversary of that riot, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League was reincorporated in New York. Having abandoned the goal of building a Jamaican Tuskegee, Garvey now embraced the mantle of the wider anti-colonial demand for self-determination, seeing his organization in connection to efforts in Egypt, Ireland, and India. Three years after its founding in New York, the historian Robert Hill notes there were 418 UNIA divisions with an additional 422 awaiting char charters. By 1924, the UNIA boasted 6 million members organized in 1400 organ separate branches. These divisions were concentrated in the United States and the Caribbean, but they also stretched to South and West Africa and included one division in Sydney, Australia. The language of political founding marked this new phase in the organization's history. Addressing members of the New York division in the summer of 1920, Garvey declared, we are a new people born out of a new day and new circumstance. We are born of the bloody war of 1914 to 1918. My talk today is concerned with the constitution of a new people, attending in particular to the role of images and performance. I argue that for the UNIA, political founding was a vehicle through which participants came to understand themselves as constituting the figure of the universal Negro, a figure represented through the convention as a transnational and empowered political subject. Political founding was on this view a process of transforming one's self-perception, of cognizing oneself as a member of a transnational people capable of transforming the prevail conditions of racial domination. Attending to the visual politics of the convention from the opening parades to the theatrical representations of the deliberation, I traced the ways in which the convention was mobilized to cultivate new habits of self-regard among those who participated in these occasions. The idea of the people, Kevin Olson has argued, works as a representational fiction, encouraging individuals to imagine themselves as a member of a collective with a unitary political will. The UNIA's practices of political founding work to transform the self-perception of its members and more ambitiously Black people unaffiliated with the organization, such that they might identify themselves as constituting the universal Negro. Yet articulated against the backdrop of racial violence in the United States and globally entrenched colonial hierarchies, while seeking to constitute a people across national and imperial boundaries, the UNIA's project of founding shares with other anti-colonial projects a distinctive problem of colonial peoplehood. This problem, Nazmul Sultan has recently argued with reference to the Indian context as the intertwined problems of disunity and underdevelopment, which perpetually defer the people as a claimable subject capable of self-authorization. In the case of the UNIA, the constitution of an empowered uh, political people 
wrestled with the disunity of geographic dispersal and the ingrained habits and feelings of racial inferiority. In light of these conditions, the UNIA's convention staged and performed political power as a strategy of instilling among the convention's participants what Jason Frank following John Adams calls a reverential self-regard by viewing themselves in their own act of self-representation as constituting the universal Negro, the new people Garvey announced would come into being, it would come into being. This is one feature of the improvement to which the name Universal Negro Improvement Association aspired. In the act of political founding, self-determination is um, or self-development is concerned with reorienting the perceived place and position of the Negro race. At stake here is a reiterative education of the senses that enables members of the UNIA to cognize the figure of the universal Negro and understand themselves as its referent. So here's just an outline of, the, of, what, of how the talk is organized. Um, I'll start by giving you a sense of this dilemma of peoplehood, this question of how you build both a transnational connection and how you overcome the problem of disempowerment. Uh, then I'll turn to think specifically about this, the way this common spectacle was enacted in the conventions and in particular the opening parade. And then describe the role of, of, of um, spectators. Um, and here spectators will have two roles. On the one hand, they become the mirrors through which this reverential self-regard is viewed. Um, and they're also the subjects of, of um, enlistment in the project of the UNIA. And then finally, I'll try to return to the question of the dilemmas of peoplehood and founding. Okay, but before I do that, I'm just gonna pass the hosting back to Wasim here so that he can let people in. And Zaris, so you'll like retweet and stuff. And okay. okay, it looks like Wasim is now host. All right, so dilemmas of peoplehood. Making the case for the historic first annual convention of the UNIA scheduled for August 1920, Garvey declared, every country has a constitution of its own. Every nation has a code of government. The month long gathering scheduled for August served a similar purpose, he explained in a later address, comparing the meeting of the UNIA's delegates to the Philadelphia convention. Though the, through the example of 1787, Garvey made explicit the UNIA's aspiration to political founding. Like the delegates at the Philadelphia Convention, the UNIA delegates were elected by lo local bodies of the organization to represent them at the deliberations of the international body. But unlike Philadelphia in 1787, no delegates came to New York in 1920 with the aim of writing a constitution for a republic. The textual product of the convention was not a constitution, but the declaration of the rights of Negro peoples of the world, a document that announced the new people as a subject, a political subject capable of declaring rights and, and capable of self-authorization. While the convention did not produce a code of government akin to the Constitution of the United States, it participated in the practice of founding a new people. When Garvey noted, we are a new people born of a new day and a new circumstance, he suggests that the birth of a new people is the inevitable culmination of the radically altered political context of the post-war period. The participation of colonial subjects and African-Americans in World War I, the example of the Bolshevik revolution and the circulation of the principle of self-determination had awakened anti-colonial nationalists across the world. But Garvey did not take the constitution of a new people for granted. In his view, it was a difficult proposition to get Negroes to see through one common spectacle. Two conditions mitigated against this effort to constitute a new people, disunity and denigration. First, the present day Negro was a scattered race. Imperial and national boundaries prevented black people from recognizing their common grievance and common complaint. First, working against national and imperial divisions, the organization aspired to instill among its members a sense of the global character of the Negro question. According to its international organizer, Henrietta Davis, 
when we scrutinize the attitude of the American, the English, the French, and the German white man, we find that all four have the same opinion of the Negro. They all believe that the Negro should be a subject race, that he is not to have self-government, that he is not capable of taking a place in the great governments of the world. But if racial domination functioned as a common experience for UNIA members, an appeal to this experience had to contend with the different instantiations of racial oppression across the world. Nationality was an accident of birth, according to Garvey, but the imperial and geographic context of the UNIA members shaped the precise experiences of domination and the possibilities for political mobilization. The, Un the United States, Garvey suggested in 1919, still offered opportunity to fight constitutionally, while Africa did not and required a future anti-imperial struggle to free the continent. Similarly, Garvey argued that his position as, the, as a subject of the British Empire committed him to claiming his rights of citizenship. Developing a common spectacle then did not mean that the organization delighted these differences. During the first convention, for instance, a whole week was devoted to short presentations of each delegate delegation representing local UNIA divisions. We want the convention to clearly understand the universal Negro situation, Garvey explained. And this required hearing from representatives of Georgia, Mississippi, the colonies of Africa, the independent states of South and Central America, as well as the islands of the West Indies. The Declaration of the Rights of Negro Peoples, which emerged from the reports of the delegates, articulated both a common experience of racial oppression and its specific and differentiated instantiations. Similarly, to address itself to the variegated local experiences of its members, the UNIA's corporate structure was a federated one. It depended on local self-organized divisions of the association, that operated on the basis of charters granted from the parent body in New York. The association's constitutions con um, contain minimal requirements for these divisions. Yet tethering together each local instantiation of the UNIA was a conception of a globe spanning movement. As Garvey put it, the Negroes common oppression exceeded these local contexts and required organizing a universal rather than a national movement. In other words, what made Garveyism a mass transnational movement was not only its institutional mo modularity, but its capacity to invest each configuration of the movement with a far reaching global significance. This was the promise of the UNIA's universality. Such a project could only succeed, however, if UNIA members recognize themselves not only as similarly oppressed, but as also part of a transnational people that felt itself to be politically empowered. And here is where the second dilemma appears, the psychic and psychological costs of a habituation to racial domination. The black race, according to Henrietta Davis and Marcus Garvey, had for far too long accepted its own subservience. The old Negro had a subservient manner with hat in hand, a bending of the body, a shrinking look and bowing as he says, yes, boss, yes, master, to every remark from the master. Through the UNIA, black people were to understand themselves as political actors who no longer tamely submitted to the indignities heaped on us by other races that call themselves superior. Black participation in the great war, Davis argued, demonstrated that the white man has no monopoly on knowledge in either field of polit political and military arts or science, art, and literature. In her claim that the Negro was already equal to the white man, Davis echoed a, wide, a wider post-war anti-colonial critique, which viewed the devastation of World War I as a condemnation of European civilization. For Davis, the post-war period marked a break from the tutelary ideal of the civilizing mission. All that is necessary on the part of the Negro, she argued, is the particular application of the knowledge he already possesses. This is the voice of the new Negro, who emerged from participation and sacrifice during the war with a newfound sense of awareness of his own political capacity. 
all that was left to do was link up your strength morally, financially, uh, with other Negroes of the world. The centrality of the war to perceptions of one's political capacity had a double valence. On the one hand, by highlighting the moral bankruptcy of the West and emphasizing the crucial role of Black soldiers, the UNIA rejected the view that Black people were politically immature or lagged behind other peoples. The UNIA's political project was consistently joined to struggles in Ireland, India, Egypt, and Eastern Europe in an age when all peoples are striking out for freedom, for liberty, and for democracy. At the same time, the recurring re reference to the Black soldier as the model of political empowerment rendered the universal Negro a masculine and martial subject. Black soldiers who fought and died in Flanders, France, and Mesopotamia modeled an exemplary courage while also authorizing the demands for equality and redress. We have already seen how this gendered hierarchy is inscribed in Van Der Zee's 1926 photo. And at the end of this talk, I'll talk a little bit about Garvey's own self-fashioning as, as an exemplary soldier statesman. I want to now think through Garvey's use of the common spectacle for the ways it draws attention to the role of theatricality and performance in the UNIA's politics of founding. As we shall soon see, um, um, creating a common sorry, creating a common spectacle understood as a lens through which Black people would see themselves as a transnational and united people required becoming a spectacle by performing collectively collectivity and political empowerment. It would be in the accretion of these performances that Black people would come to see themselves as people who are masters of ourselves. So this part of the talk is drawn from uh, a convention bullet bulletin uh, during the, uh, especially the 1920 con uh, convention, uh, the UNIA generated a daily report uh, published as the convention bulletin, which was circulated during the meetings and then also reproduced in the weekly newspaper, uh, The Negro World, which was published uh, from 1919 uh, to 1933. The annual convention, according to a, a Howard University professor at the time, Kelly Miller, was a visible inauguration of the new people united by common cause and empowered by a sense of political capacity. The division's delegates, UNIA members and spectators were assembled to produce the common spectacle through which the, they would come to perceive themselves as the universal Negro. The first convention in 1920 began on August 1st with the convening of 2000 uh, delegates representing 22 countries and ended on August 31st with closing ceremonies and parades. A parade on August 3rd started at the UNIA headquarters on West 135th Street and wound its way through Harlem. Representatives of the Black Star Line and Negro Factories Corporation, the organization's two commercial enterprises led the parade. Following it were in automobiles were Garvey, Davis and other high officials of the association wearing their academic regalia. Behind them, the possession, procession included the Black Star Line Choir, divisional marching bands, the Women's Black Cross Nurses, and the African Legion. Central to this image of a transnational people was a careful balancing of multiplicity and unity. For instance, the parade reproduced the divisional structure of the organization, um, and everyone was organized by the local settings of its members. So you marched with wherever you were from. The Negroes of the world were not one undivided people, but represented under the banner of their respective country, state, or island. Additionally, the participants carried signs that reflected competing demands and political slogans. Uh, so slogans like Africa for the Africans and Africa a nation one and divisible stood in conjunction with banners that read, we believe in the liberal institutions of America, long live America. Liberty Hall, where the convention proceedings took place, was decorated with the buntings and flags of various countries, including England, Africa, the United States, Haiti, Panama, Central America, San Domingo, and the other world empires and nations. In these practices, the UNIA played up its transnational political membership. 
It was the convention of the Negro peoples of the world, but one that sought to join together the scattered race and consolidate its racial force. The parade synchronicity produced by carefully tailored regalia and uniforms, as well as the choreographed tempo of the procession, weave together the tapestry of national affiliations and political visions to represent the universal Negro. Like the use of the tricolor, tricolor cockade and proposals for a national con costume in revolutionary France, the parade created virtual unity through symbolic means. Assembled together and marching in unison, the UNIA members transcended the specific claims and experiences of racial domination to manifest a new image of self-assertion and political empowerment. According to the convention's daily bulletin, it was a parade expressive as it was intended to be of the Negro's seriousness, his unswerving, unswervable determination to solve his own problems by larger reliance on his own resource and power, physically, economically, religiously, and otherwise than heretofore. The image of an assertive and newly empowered black race, according to the bulletin again, presented a thrilling, spectacular scene that was dazzling to the eyes of the most imaginative. This image, the coverage continued, this time the coverage continued, imagination has been outguessed as every onlooker must admit. The scene of the parade interrupts the public association of blackness with denigration and recasts a racial unity predicated on disenfranchisement. In, his, in its place, in, it, it inserts an image of political empowerment, an image that acts out the, at, that the as, as yet unrealized aspiration for self-government. It is an image of the unimaginable power of the Negro race. This is a dazzling picture, one that observers cannot take their eyes off. Twice, the bulletin describes the gaze of spectators as taking the form of a morbid curiosity that looks on as if the parliament of Negroes was a circus. Observers at first experience awe and negative astonishment. But by the closing parade on August 31st, this initial affect is transformed into sympathy, respect, and admiration. This transformation of negative astonishment to sympathy and respect contains elements of a Burkean sublime. For Edmund Burke, we might remember, the sublime had the quality of delightful horror, which initially produces an astonishment before generating admiration, reverence, and respect. With this parallelism of the language of the, between the UNIA's bulletin and Burke's account, I want to suggest that what mass, the mass assembly of the parade and the convention produce is a sublime image of the Negro race. It is through producing this image of a powerful, awe-inspiring people that the UNIA members come to have reverential self-regard. I'm drawn to this formulation because it clarifies the stakes of spectacular mass assembly. It also reframes the project of race pride with which Black nationalist movements are deeply associated. Black pride is often viewed as a project of affirming the historical achievements of African descended peoples with the aim of undoing the social stigma and shame associated with blackness. Though Garveyism was invested in cultivating this form of race pride, the parade and convention worked less through appeals to histories of past achievements and instead sought to engender an identification with the universal Negro through a present staging of political empowerment. There is then a recursive quality to the working of race pride understood as a reverential self-regard, for it is one's own performance of, uh, of empowerment rather than the accomplishments of one's ancestors that inspires reverence. But in order for this cultivation of reverential self-regard to work, it must be circuited through a spectator who can be awed who can have the experience of having their negative astonishment transformed into admiration. The bulletin thus zeroes in on the experiences of spectators. And strikingly, the spectators are other disempowered subjects, women and the Irish, who might themselves be engaged in similar efforts of staging political empowerment. So let, let me take three uh, examples from the text here. 
First, the bulletin tells us, white women were seen to cry at the scene of the parade. This response to the parade's insistent note of liberty is not registered as emerging from fear of the uniformed black paraders. Instead, their cries are spurred by having beheld the Negro achieving that measure of success that they themselves under similar distressing conditions in other parts of the world are fighting to achieve themselves. The 19th Amendment uh, granting women the vote in the United States had just passed Congress only a year earlier, and it would be ratified as the UNIA's first convention took place. Here, the bu bulletin makes reference to the ongoing struggle for the right to vote in Britain, where suffragettes had won a partial victory with a 1918 expansion. Par parades of this very kind that the UNIA had staged had been important features of the suffragette movement on both sides of the Atlantic. Second, when the parade gets to 125th Street in Harlem, the bulletin introduces us to an Irish woman who with tears upon her cheeks in the anguish of despair, in the gloom of hopelessness cried, and to think the Negroes will get their liberty before the Irish. Her reaction is recorded as just one sign of a visual, visible change in the attitude of the Irish towards the Negro as manifested in today's pride. A more astonishing and third example can be found among the Irish police reserves on duty during the parade, whose behavior, uh, the bulletin recounts, was exemplary and so notably different from their customary conduct. While often violent and hostile to Harlem's Black residents, the Irish police are at least momentarily drawn to the sympathy and fellow feeling that makes us so wondrously kind to each other. This sympathy, does not emanate from a pre-existing solidarity, but it is catalyzed by the experience of viewing the manifestation of an assertive and empowered black race. Through, though these depictions center the spectator's perspective, I wanna suggest that the affective responses of white women and Irish police officers uh, to the spectacle of the parade are not the central concern. That is, this, these accounts are not meant to signal that the UNIA can win over allies or persuade audiences of the legitimacy of their cause. I mean, this is a moment in some ways where Garveyism, like other anti-colonial nationalist movements, has foregone the, the kind of a politics of appeal and petition. So instead then, these reactions serve to reflect back to the participants and to those who would read about uh, the, the parade in the Negro world, the political power manifested in the parade. So UNIA members develop a reverential self-regard by coming to see themselves as representing a newly assertive people in the eyes of spectators who are also disempowered. That these are figures who might have engaged in their in or know of similar efforts to stage the collective power of a disempowered people makes them particularly astute observers. But because self-regard depends in this way on the spectatorial gaze, it is a fragile enterprise, always in need of reinforcement. When the bulletin narrative, while the bulletin narrative constantly assures us that spectators have indeed been appropriately awed by the scene of black political empowerment, there is always a chance that the mirror of their gaze might not register the sublime image of the race. For instance, the reportage uh, indicates the fragility of this dependence when it notes the reactions of white journalists who are dispatched to cover the convention, but seem nonplussed by its unusual character and far reaching objects. These spectators view the project of African redemption as nothing but a wild dream. It is for this reason that the act of founding a new people could not be limited to one extraordinary moment. Instead, it was a reiterative practice, not only repeated annually at the conventions, but also inserted into everyday organizational practices. UNIA uniforms, for instance, were worn at weekly meetings and sometimes outside of the UNIA settings. Parades and pageants were also reenacted by local divisions. Describing one such parade in Cuba, for instance, the Negro world reported, 
For the first time in Cuban history, an assemblage of Negroes united under one true and sublime cause of the UNIA paraded the principal streets of the city. The perceptual shift required to develop a reverential self-regard sedimented in these recurring and recursive practices of staging, performing, and viewing a transnational and politically empowered spectacle of the Negro race. While spectators are not the direct object of the UNIA's persuasive appeal, the convention did seek to draw in its far larger Black audience. Here we have the contagious character of reverential self-regard. The bulletin tells us that most Black uh, attendees are initially curiosity seekers who flocked to the meetings, particularly in the first week's sessions. At work here too is a morbid curiosity, an attraction that compels by being disruptive and disturbing. But in the course of attending the convenings, curiosity is subconsciously changed to a feeling and spirit of enthusiasm by which they see and hear, uh, by what they see and hear, only to be converted before leaving the room to a belief in the worthiness and greatness of the cause. The choice of conversion here suggests that even passive skeptical black spectators are drawn in so that they might identify with the UNIA's political project and see it as their own. To return once more to Burke, the sublime is associated with an irresistible force that compels and attracts. The awe-inspiring spectacle of the universal Negro unmoors one from settled convictions and, and perceptions. It compels and attracts new adherents. It is in this process of conversion that the reverential self-regard of the UNIA becomes con contagious. Spectators are drawn to identifying with the image of the new Negro performed to, during the convention to see themselves as part of the newly empowered political people. Central to this labor of conversion is the perfect order and becoming decorum of the proceedings. The bulletin tells us there is a complete absence of those features bordering on the ludicrous and the grotesque, which is pleasing to the Black audience. This recurring emphasis on the orderliness of the convention bespeaks a self-consciousness about the critical and mocking depictions of the UNIA's spectacular and theatrical politics, even in the Black press. For instance, W.E.B. Du Bois jibed, a casual obser observer might have mistaken the parade and convention for the dress rehearsal of a new comic opera. Du Bois recognizes the aesthetic quality of the convention, but where the UNIA um, aspires to produce a sublime image of the race, he perceives comedy. Against this and other mocking descriptions, the bulletin draws attention to the ways that the convention follows normative scripts of political assembly. It is a pro it is a performance that properly acts out the and then they're like wonderful, brilliant. Um, but rather than stayed and, and subdued, it generates enthusiasm and excitement. So take, for instance, the public reading of the Declaration of the Rights of Negro Peoples of the World on the 13th day of the convention. The declaration referred to as the Magna Carta of Negro Rights and Liberties is itself a script of political claims making, which signals the UNIA's embodiment of proper political form. The act of declaring rights is recalled as a solemn, dramatic occasion. This declaration is a sacred document because it is the declaration of a new race of Black people of the world who no longer suffer injustice and wrong. Yet as each article is read out loud, solemnity is interrupted by uproarious applause. The enthusiasm of the audience exhibited in cheering and shouting, even whistling with the waving of hand handkerchiefs was almost indescribable. The audience is frantic with joy and seemed unable to give sufficient vent to their feelings of approbation. Here in a description that mimics this experience of religious frenzy, the bulletin aims to capture the UNIA's project of conversion. The image of self-authorization represented in the declaration overpowers the audience. Their exuberant response has a spontaneous and a contagious quality that envelopes the whole room. On, one, on the one hand, their exuberance and excessive response 
of the Black audience registers once more the staging of political empowerment. On the other hand, this response indicates the transformation of spectators, passive spectators into converts who have caught the spirit of the UNIA. These spectators are drawn to see themselves in the image of the universal Negro being performed and constituted in the process of the convention. If white spectators are introduced to mirror black, to mirror back an image of self-assertion and, um, and empowerment, the same image instills among its black viewers an identification with the scene of political empowerment. But just as the white spectatorial gaze could fail to register the sublime image of the race and thereby threaten the development of reverential self-regard, the effort at conversion may not yield the kind of transformation depicted above. The bulletin notes that the enthusiasm generated in the course of the convention may not be enough to win over all viewers to the cause of the UNIA. For this group of spectators who are inclined to stay aloof, the fine musical program and eloquent soul-inspiring addresses which filled the evening sessions were high, uh, would leave some uh, impression. Witnessing the scenes of dignity and solemnity sends a thrill of pride through every colored man and woman who saw it, whether this, they had previously considered the opinions of, um, whatever their previous opinions of, about the efficacy of the UNIA. That the process of conversion to the cause of the UNIA may not be completed in the course of the convention indicates once more the fragility of the enterprise of political founding. The work of generating a common spectacle was, as Garvey put it, a difficult proposition, one that required reiterative staging and restaging. As an opening salvo into this ongoing practice, the first convention in August 1920 marked a rupture. It was a, the founding of a race that now, after centuries of injustice, was celebrating the, its new birth, the dawning for them of a new day, an age undreamt of by their ancestors. And this rebirth I have tried to suggest was centrally tied to the UNIA's visual politics, to its effort to generate a common spectacle, to set before black people a picture of their own collective power. Um, I have a, uh, maybe I'll take a few minutes to wrap up very quickly. Um, so throughout the 1920s, the visual politics of Garveyism was a major subject of debate and ambivalence in Black politics. Many figures from E. Franklin Frazier to W.E.B. Du Bois to Chandler Owens recognized the theatricality of the movement as central to its mass appeal. Um, but at the same time, they worried that its imagistic quality signaled a dangerous form of crowd politics in which masses were manipulated. Garveyism, they argued, was dem demagoguery or mob politics. For these critics, the spectacle was not empowering, but enervating. It did not rework self-regard, but instead it directed the gaze of Garveyites to the enthralling figure of Garvey as political leader. Exemplary of this redirection was Garvey's own explicit self-fashioning as the Black Emperor especially after he abandoned academic regalia in favor of military attire, beginning with the third annual convention in 1922. In 1940, the year of Garvey's death, um, CLR James would take this critique to its logical con conclusion, likening Garvey to a race fanatic who eerily resembled um, Hitler. His program, he suggested, had a nebulousness similar to the Nazi program, and in his emphasis on uniforms, parades, military guards, in short, the dramatic and spectacular, Garvey anticipated Nazism. In my concluding minutes, I wanna suggest that in contrast to this critique of the movement's aesthetics, that we might better grasp the dilemmas and contradictions of the movement's visual politics through a re-engagement with the problem and politics of founding. Um, so making, making the use of spectacle as such the primary object of critique assumes that the aestheticization of politics is necessarily fascist. And of course, in its fem most strongest formulation, um, this argument uh, suggests with Walter ben Benjamin that all efforts to aestheticize politics culminate in one point, and that point is war. To get at an alternative possibility, we might remember that Garveyism 
like all projects of political founding, are what Angelica Bernal calls under-authorized authorizations, in which political actors challenge the unstable and incomplete authority of an existing political order, often from a pre precarious or insufficiently authoritative place. So from this perspective, the UNIA's politics of founding is doubly under-authorized. It operates from a precarious position within the United States, um, and this is made clear in the constant surveillance of the movement. And its, its claim to represent the universal Negro is called to question by many competing claimants to this very mantle. So as with other moments of founding in the history of political thought, the UNIA sought to shroud this under authorization by appeal to a single and unified founder in the figure of Garvey himself. As the lawgiver, Garvey was represented as the heteronomic agent who is simultaneously the source of legitimacy, but also outside of it and indeed superior to it. So to return to the bulletin's language once more, the, convention, the bulletin repeatedly returns to the unmatchable leadership of Marcus Garvey and his genius as the source of the convention's spectacular proceedings. And while it is the collective image manifested in the convention that produces astonishment and admiration among its, its spectators, Garvey is celebrated as its architect, as the one man who by his vision and backbone is putting the Negro on the map of real achievement. The sartorial choices of academic regalia and later military attire for Garvey and other, union, other UNIA leaders registered key founding figure tropes, the philosopher king and the soldier statesman. Not only in this self-fashioning, but also in his writings, Garvey readily embraced the role of the lawgiver. For instance, in his, his 1925 essay, Governing the Ideal State advocates the rule of the of virtuous statesmen as an alternative to the decadence and corruption of the modern state. The ideal was one in which absolute authority would be vested in, in the president, a strict gender division of labor in the home underwrites the public spheres, and crimes of state, especially corruption and treason, are severely punished. Gar Garvey's harsh penal system in this essay is drawn directly from Plato's laws. And he later described the essay as a hypothetical founding similar to the city and speech of Plato's Republic. So the legacy of this tension between a collectively enacted image of the race and an image tied to the figure of Garvey persists in contemporary scholarship where the framing is where it's framed around Garvey or Garveyism. Historians, especially social historians, have sought to reach beyond the figure of Garvey to reveal the multiplicity of political projects that were enacted under the broad umbrella of Garveyism. Uh, what I wanna suggest though, is that this disaggregation of movement from leader might not be easily achievable given the ways in which the figure of Garvey's leadership emerged as the site for the displaced dilemma of under authorization internal to the movement's uh, politics of founding. So a more thorough ex exploration of the place and role of political leadership in popular movements is required to think through the relationship between Garveyism and Garvey. So this is what I, where I hope to turn next, but what I hope to have persuaded you of today is the connection between political founding, theatricality, and visual politics in the movement. Garvey's deep investments in spectacle and performance are tied to the central political question question of how to constitute a people. And Garveyites practices shared strategies with a wide array of popular movements from the 20th century, from the suffragette movement to the Russian Revolution. Recognizing these convergences, we might begin to assess the contradictions and dilemmas of Garveyism, less as particular to its brand of Black nationalism or to the psychological profile of its leader. Instead, we might view Garveyism as a window into wider questions about popular politics. In its specific aim of founding a transnational people out of the experience of racial domination, it brings into sharp relief the labors of performance, staging, and enacting necessary to the practice of founding, while also dramatizing the fragile character of this political enterprise. Thank you. Sorry. as well. So the floor is open for questions. 
uh, and we've got till 6.40. Max Skonsberg, please go ahead. Should I have the video on as well, or just um, just the voice? Th thank you so much. Just a quick uh, question. Um, so you, you talked about the politics of the crowd, popular politics, the politics of, of spectacle. So I was just wondering if the movement had, um, in addition to that, had a strategy or a an agenda for how to influence existing political structures, um, for example, by black representatives in existing legislatures um, or, or, or things like that. So how, how did they relate to talk about um, and, th and think about existing structures um, at, the more, at, at the legislative level? Thank you. Um, okay, great. Thanks for that question. Um, I mean, a very short answer there. There's little um, legislative uh, work that the UNIA is engaged in. I mean, they they are interested and engaged in trying to make interventions in the League of Nations. There are various correspondences uh, from the UNIA to the League, especially around the mandates in Africa at this time. But largely the political program of the organization is centered at the local divisional level. And that really varies depending on the particular kinds of context. So say in the context of Cuba and Panama where most of the members are migrant laborers who are working um, in plantations and previously on the canal, um, there are sometimes ways in which the UNI supports uh, labor strikes and, and uh, the efforts of laborers um, in other, I mean, another very important part of the program, of the vision of the UNIA is its kind of commercial enterprises, of course, most importantly, the Black Star Line shipping company and this Negro factories company. So the, there isn't a, a kind of interest or investment in the standard um, legislative processes or of, of, of the existing countries, but an attempt to create parallel institutions. Um, um, and that has to do with the, the perceived sense that there's a kind of roadblock in those existing institutional forms. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, Wasim, did you ask me to speak? Uh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry, you just broke up at the moment you, you spoke. Um, Adam, thank you. It was a, that was a fascinating paper, um, well outside of my own field, but uh, I was completely convinced by your argument about founding. It seems like, a, um, uh, well, I suppose what I want to ask you to do is if you could extend on that idea at all, in relation to the a, another context, rather than looking forward to fascism, why not look backward to the American colonization society uh, and Liberia and think about the founding that there was a link, wasn't there, between um, Garveyism and and Liberia and and thinking about the founding of a new um, a new state. So just in terms of I put up my hand at this point, just because in terms of the previous question, rather than thinking about legislative action, it seems to be that there was certainly interest about really founding a new state based upon these ideas. Yes, um, there is a, I mean, the emphasis on, there is a kind of connection with Liberia and um, one in which Li Liberian representatives also come to the conventions and so forth. But, mm -hmm. but the, the, you know, I think one reading of the UNIA is that its primary object is the founding of a state uh, and the founding of, of a state vis -a -vis through Liberia. So there is a brief, there is some interest in a colonization and extending that scheme. But one, this, this, the emphasis on actually settling in Liberia, mm. that emphasis becomes more pronounced as other, as the movement falls into greater, greater crisis, right? So when it's founded and 
into the probably until probably 1922, there is interest in supporting Liberia. There's attempts to raise money and resources to support the Liberian state. There's mm -hmm. even some interest in getting um, skilled people who are engineers, doctors, et cetera, to go to Liberia and support the Liberian state. But Garvey repeatedly says, our vision isn't one in which we all settle you know, in Liberia or settle on the continent. It, it's yeah. one in which we help to support Liberia to ensure that it's, has that it's a sufficiently independent state um and but not one that necessarily will be where we all reside and i think this is connected to i mean the real you know the real like the vision and model of what the unia is trying to do is the british empire i mean it's trying to make up for the sense of a loss of imperial belonging and so the idea is to have a state, an African state, maybe Liberia, that is capable of protecting its subjects wherever they might be. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a diaspora or a citizenship that's that stretches beyond territorial bounds wow. persists as an imagination of of, of um, mm. the UNI. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I actually, was it, was it possible to follow up very briefly on that? Of course, yes. Um, I mean, so not entirely unlike then, say, um, John Robert Seeley's idea of the empire of British people, yeah, the expansion of England, not not so long before. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this this is hopefully I will I'll be able to make the case for that as the real driving, animating right. vision of of the um, organization. But I really think, I think my own view is that the um, question of settlement in Africa has been overemphasized in how the, the mm -hmm. movement has been. That's what that I want to That really know. remains right. attached to this kind of imperial form and a kind of deterritorialized vision of, of, mm -hmm. of kind of political belonging. Right, okay, I understand, thank you. Um, so just a note for this Q&A session, um, the seminar is being recorded and the recording is going to be uploaded to the IHR website. So if you ask a question and you'd rather be left out the recording, just um, email me um, after the session and I can cut that sec section out. Um, we don't have any questions in the queue, so I might abuse my chair's privilege briefly here and ask. Um, Oh, there is someone in the queue now. I'll, I'll be quick. So, um, is there a particularly close connection between uh, black theology or religious symbolism and the visual politics that Garvey and Garveyism mobilize? Uh, and I'm thinking of some literature that um, has presented Garvey as a kind of pragmatic theologian, sort of opportunistically mobilizing religious symbolism and writes, but if the spectators in many cases were white Christians with a certain form of Christianity um, they adhered to, was there a strong religious dimension to the sort of iconography you were talking about? I suppose it's quite a simple point really, or question. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you, I have to do more work on this, but I think there is definitely some, um, you know, I don't know, not all um, opportunistic, but some investment and interest in black religiosity. I mean, one is just when, when Garvey comes to the United States, actually the first, this first speech he tries to give, um, he's, he faints and he's like completely incapable of, um, of, of, of kind of, you know, he's so far from the rhetorician and orator he's known for becoming in the twenties. Um, so he spends a lot of time in churches and evangelical churches in particular as a way of learning how to engage in rhetoric and how to, how to engage in a way of, of persuasion. Um, so there's something about um, religious rhetoric and forms of, of speech that, that he really emphasizes and, and encourages his, his uh, encourages Garveyites to similarly practice rhetoric in these ways. Um, I think more or less maybe another version of this is the ways that Garvey himself and Garveyites uh, think of Garvey as the kind of Moses-like figure. Um, and 
there's many, many uh, members of the organization all over the world who write to the Negro World paper, you know, with language that repeatedly presents Garvey as a sort of Moses-like figure. So again, a kind, um, I think, I think the religiosity is less, it's less directed at or it was directed at the white spectators in this case, but draws on and reinforces um, a spe uh, kind of African American practices, and it's directed towards especially African Americans, I think, um, in the US. Great, thank you. Um, Roshana uh, Bajpai, um, if you want to unmute yourself, you had your hand up. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, um, Adam. That was a, a great um, paper, I think, and I really um, uh, thought there was so many thought-provoking and insightful uh, points uh, for my own work. But my question is about the scope of your argument. I'm very persuaded by the frame that you um, elaborate as an interpretive frame for understanding Garvey. I'm wondering though, whether you're in ugly, sorry, my, um, I don't have the best connection at the moment. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so my question is whether uh, you intend it more broadly for understanding, I mean, what's, how far do you want to go with your argument is, is yeah, very crudely put the question in terms of, whether all foundings uh, of uh, disunited, uh, dispossessed people would, that one would need a sort of spectacle, a single figure, um, uh, that uh, theater in order to bring that together, because that I'm less persuaded by. And of course, there are lots of examples uh, from within that you cited. Um, and I would be interested in seeing what, or, or learning more about what the other alternatives were that were provided. Uh, by Du Bois and others, um, or CLR James and other critics uh, for um, Black unity. And um, of course, at that time, uh, there were other models within anti-colonial movements elsewhere in the world. So yeah, just a response to that, but great uh, paper and project. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks so much. Um... I think so partly um, the paper draws in some ways on work by um, Jason Frank and Helica Bernal and Kevin Olson who who are thinking through um, questions of founding and people making in in, in 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 sort of the US context in the French revolutionary context. And I was drawn and interested in the ways that they too are picking up on and rethinking the role of visuality of aesthetics. Um, it's certainly not the same kinds of aesthetics, of course, they're very different kinds of projects and the work that 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 visuality or performance is being mobilized to do in those contexts are very different. Um, uh, so, so on the one hand, I think there may be something about the ways in which performance and theatricality plays a role in, in the sense of self, how do you come to see yourself as a people? That, that it plays some kind of role, but I don't think that that the form of the aesthetics is always the same. I mean, I so, and then I think that the second question or related to you is was whether all versions of black yeah. unity or project, whether they all also engage in aesthetics. I mean, I think on the one hand, this this Garvey, I, Garveyism is happening in the context of a cultural resurgence called the New Negro Movement, which is all about transforming the self perception of Black people, but not, you know, you know, th largely through literature, through the written word. Um, and there's a real debate about what is the purpose of this new form of self representation. How are we supposed to self represent ourselves, to to ourselves, but also to the world and um, I think of Garveyism as an intervention in that broader debate. So I'll just give you an example about Du Bois, for instance. Du Bois, yeah, I mean, he hates the, the kind of theatricality of the Garveyite movement, but in 1913, he writes a pageant called The Star of Ethiopia, uh, in which there's 4,000 <laughs> actors. It's performed in front of audiences that are 20,000 20, people. It's performed. <laughs> 
in 1915 and, and again in 1925. Um, and these pageants are supposed to be um, um, like depictions of black history. So it starts from, you know, the discovery of iron in Africa to Frederick Douglass, right? And so these theatrical representations, I mean, so it's not that like Du Bois is uninterested or not engaged in the question of theatrical representation, but what he, he makes the case that um, the kind of the theater that he's interested in has a, is, educates in a different kind of way. It's meant to generate a, what he calls a reasonable form of race pride um, that's not brazen or strident or militaristic in the ways that Garby, Garbyism is, right? So I think, I, I take Garbyism to be an intervention in a wider debate that's happening about, about how to represent the Negro race to itself and to the rest of the world. And so there's, it's not a debate that necessarily, I think the critics think it's a debate that's whether or not to engage in imagistic and visual politics, but really they're all engaged in a form of imagistic and visual politics. The debate is what form that should take in this period. Great, thank you, thanks a lot. Um, so we have a question in the chat box, uh, quite a straightforward question. Um, would you liken Garvey to anyone today, Shane Smith asks? I don't, uh, I don't know about that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess, um, you know, I, th I, I want to think about Garveyism as a really politics, a political project that emerges in a in a very specific conjuncture that has to do with the a perceived crisis of imperial prolonging and a moment in which um, the kind of nationalism that's that we that that gives rise to the post-colonial nation states in Africa and Asia has not yet been articulated, right? So it's this interregnum project and it, it's it, it is as a result also uncertain about its, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's very attached to the imperial form on the other, on the one hand, yet it imagines transcending empire on the other. So I think it's worth reading it as a very specific kind of formation that emerges out of the that moment. But I mean, as I think the comments near the end suggest, I'm also interested in thinking about how it could be that Garveyism reveals certain kinds of dilemmas about popular politics and especially around this question about the relationship between leader and people. And I, I, I don't have a contemporary figure in mind that represents that, but um, I think of it as a kind of reoccurring problem or question. Great, thanks, Adam. So um, we have six minutes uh, left to our extended time, uh, end time, uh, and two questions. So Gareth, um, uh, well, Hannah Dawson, if you could ask your question, and then Gareth, if you could ask yours, and perhaps Adam can take them both uh, together. Uh, so go ahead, Hannah, please. Thank you so much, um, and hello, that was so brilliant, I loved it. Um, I just have a, a tiny question about the naming of the association and the significance or anxiety that might have surrounded the invocation of the notion of the universal, um, universal Negro. I mean, obviously, historically, the notion of the universal had been inherently exclusive. Um, exclusive of black people, exclusive of women. And I wonder whether there's a kind of polemical point to, to that self-naming to say we are universal, um, we are human, um, or whether it's just a point about transnationalism. Thank you. Yeah. Gareth, please um, go ahead and ask. If I can come in, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask something about the relationship between theatricality and politics in the situation, you know, in the in the aftermath of the First World War. Um, and I was particularly wanted to ask about the choice of imagery of empire. Um, and I was uh, wondering whether uh, you, you, you mentioned quite a lot about the sort of British Empire in, in one, uh, one aspect. Um, but could it be Rome? Could it be an African model? Um, how much does the clothing that um, he adopts um, suggest a, a particular image of what empire was going to mean? Um, thanks. Thank you. 
Um, okay, on the um, the, uni the universal of Universal Negro Improvement Association, I mean, I, I'll say to Hannah that I think that um, I am interested in reading the claim of universality in those terms, and this is just a reoccurring preoccupation of my work is to think about the ways in which Black political thought um, generates its own kinds, its own visions of the universal or its own universality. I mean, um, Garvey himself, the way he tells this, he tells a story about how he came to the term Universal Negro Improvement Association, which is that after spending time in London, he's sailing back to uh, the West Indies and on the ship he encounters a, um, a West Indian, um, fellow West Indian who's just coming back from Southern Africa. And uh, he's coming back with his, uh, with his wife who's, um, from, from South Africa, if I remember correctly. And, um, it, and they're just in the, the West Indians tells him all about like what the experience of the natives is like in Africa. And, and he, he comes to this realization that, um, well, you know, it must, there, there's a kind of universal experience of blackness. So he tells it as a story of transnationalism. I mean, I think that story though also suggests what your question implied around the exclusionary character of universality or the maybe internally hierarchical character of it. So that's a story in which um, Africa is named as co-evil and is present on the ship vis-a-vis -vis the presence of the woman. But of course, she never speaks about the conditions of Africa. It's all interacted through the two West Indian men. Um, so the, there's this kind of and this would be a reoccurring kind of framing, not just of Garveyism, but of black nationalism of the late 19th and of the 19th and early 20th century is both a kind of, of course, the gendered hierarchy and the civilizational vision vis-a-vis -vis Africa that West Indians or new world black people um, are going to play the role of vanguard or play the role of uplift vis-a-vis -vis the African continent. So it's, it's a similarly, internally variegated or hierarchical conception of universality. Um, and then I have, thanks Garrett for this question about theatricality and politics. I, um, I mean, there are ways that the, a lot of things that the, um, uh, the UNI does in terms of theatricality are modeled in some ways on the British empire. So this parade before the opening of the convention is an allusion to the, of course, the procession that opens the House of Commons. Uh, but this is also a very West Indian practice. I mean, like practices of carnival, of parade and pageantry often mimicked and, and poked fun at um, imperial and monarchical forms. So I think there is a, there's one way to read the, these practices, which is that they really emerge out of carnival practice, I mean, Caribbean carnival practices of satire and burlesque and so forth. Um, I think the other way that, I mean, the other thing which I briefly mentioned is just the cent centrality of the soldier figure. I mean, these are all largely martial uniforms. Um, the women's uniforms are, of course, a reference to the Red Cross and to, to the role of nurses. So this is also a kind of images that are deeply, deeply tied to the experience of having gone to war. Um, but I think you see less, I mean, um, you know, there is no, for instance, uh, attempts to invoke Africa, African royalty, at least in dress although there are many allusions to African monarchical forms. Um, so for instance, in, um, at, in 1921, during the second convention, um, they, there's a, a knighthood, an order of Ethiopia created and it's, people are knighted. This becomes, a, again, a very Europe, a British practice of knighting, but, but presented as, an, as being knighted into an Ethiopian empire, basically. Um, so I, th I think of the references as primarily British. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk. Thank you.
Um, well, it's now 6.41, um, so I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I'm sure there are many more people who'd like to ask questions. Um, before I ask you to join me in thanking Adon, uh, I'd just uh, like to say that there is uh, an early career IHR History of Political Ideas seminar that takes place at the same time next week. And the week after, we'll be returning uh, to host Durban Mitra from Harvard, who will be speaking on sexuality and the colonial origins of modern social thought. I think Derba is in the room uh, with us. So um, finally, uh, please join me in thanking Adon uh, for a really, really dazzling uh, talk. I don't actually know how we thank people on Zoom seminars. So you can click the reactions button apparently and give Adon a thumbs up or a clap. So thank you so much, Adon, for joining us. And thanks for having me.